Uh, thanks, Sachin. It's a real pleasure to be here. And after a ride on the bike, I really do feel like I'm in India now. So if, uh, if you're going to ride motorbikes, it's best to know a little bit about multi-ligament knee injuries. And uh, so I know just a little bit, and uh, I'll do my best to show you uh, what that is. So we're going to talk about my approach to the multi-ligament knee. As we know, the definition is a complete disruption of at least two of the four major ligament complexes. If it's dislocated, it's the position of the tibia relative to the femur. If it's reduced, it's the direction of major instability. The pattern of injury is there is no pattern of injury. There is a heterogeneous group of multiple options for the way these ligaments can be disrupted. It makes it a very difficult group of patients to study, uh, as does their demographics. We've got a little bit of experience in our group around managing multi-ligament knees. We've got about 260 knees in our last review of our database about a year ago. Uh, we've got injury pattern information, clinical outcomes on most of them, and gait analysis and a few other things like MRI on a subset of them. And that'll guide some of the things I'm gonna talk about. The first thing I'd say, and what I tell the patients, is that a multi-ligament knee injury is gonna have a significant impact on knee function. Rarely do we return the knee to normal. We can, it's possible. Um, and for coos daily living and pain scores, it's pretty good. But for symptoms, sports, and quality of life, it's uh, difficult to get back to a completely normal knee. You tend to lose one tegna level of activity, and the whole curve shifts a little bit to the left, you know, further indicating that lack of restoration of normality for them as a group. In our gait analysis, we saw that they walk just a little slower, they step just a little shorter, they spend more time in stance phase and more time in double stance phase, suggesting some concern about that knee function. But how do we optimize it? How do we take that and get as many of them as normal as possible? So we use this approach, the idea of Kaizen. The first step is you wanna get my priorities right. The acute and delayed multi-ligament knee injury are very different beasts. In the acute setting, you're often dealing with a multi-trauma and you need to manage the patient. Then you manage the limb, it's a vascular neurological issue, and then you manage the knee. In the delayed presentation, the, knee, the patient's stable, so you can focus on trying to diagnose the exact pattern of instability and then manage the knee appropriately. The majority of these are high energy injuries, just over half are road accidents, about a quarter are sporting injuries, two thirds are contact injuries. And as part of those injury mechanisms, there's a lot of multi-trauma to deal with. Thoracic and abdominal trauma, long bone trauma, spine and head injuries uh, should all be managed appropriately. Local injuries to the soft tissue, the nerve, the vascular structures, the tibial plateau fractures, and the meniscus are all uh, common. And you start with managing the patient on EMST principles, assessment and management as required. You do a rapid vascular and neurological assessment, reduce and stabilize the knee, and repeat those assessments and have them guide management. They need to be dealt with first. The third priority is the knee itself, definitive imaging and then management. This can be a limb-threatening injury. The literature reports up to a 15% rate of vascular injury. In our experience, it was much lower than that, about 3%. There was no relationship with the KD classification. And the question is, how do you assess this? You can use clinical assessment, Doppler, uh, ABIs, CT angiogram, or formal angiogram. And there's a raging debate about how aggressive you need to be in the assessment. Our approach has always been selective angiography, and that's supported by the literature. There's multiple studies that support that if you manage these appropriately in a selective fashion, the only thing you might miss is an occult intimal tear, which you're gonna manage with observation anyway. So with a knee dislocation, we reduce the knee and we assess for ischemia. If it's ischemic, it goes straight to the operating theater for a formal on-table angiogram and management. If it's well perfused, then you look for pulse symmetry. If there's asymmetric pulses, they get a CT angiogram. If the pulses are symmetric, you check the ABI. If the ABI is greater than 0.9, you observe them for the next 24 hours, and that's the end of it. If it's less than 0.9, they get a CT angiogram. Neurological examination should be done pre and post reduction. You're looking at common perineal nerve via dorsiflexion power, eversion power, and dorsal sensation. Tibial nerve with plantar flexion power and plantar sensation. And about a third of these cases will have a neurological injury, according to the literature. It's much more common if the postlateral corner is injured, 30% versus 4% if it's not in the review by Kahn. And the degree of disruption of the postlateral corner gives you a good clue about how likely there is to be a formal injury. If you've got a complete disruption of the LCL, popliteal fibula, and a biceps avulsion, it's 40% rate of common perineal nerve injury. In our series, it was just over 8%, but if there was a three ligament injury, it was almost a quarter of those had some neurological disturbance. 20% of the patients who had a postlateral corner injury had a neurological injury. Fortunately, the majority are neuropraxias rather than true neuropnesis, but they did have lower functional scores for IKDC, CUS, and Tegna. They get worse outcomes if they damage the nerve. That's the very simple algorithm. Uh, I'm a simple surgeon, so we make it even more simple. 
If it's intact, it gets a neurolysis and observe. If it's transected and it can be reopposed, it gets repaired. And if it needs anything fancier than that, prepare for a tendon transfer because it's not going to work. Reduced with simple inline traction and manipulation, they don't tend to be difficult to reduce. Unless there's that buttonhole femoral condyle out the quads, they're easy to reduce. And then bracing should be the amount, minimum amount required to maintain a stable congruent reduction. Simple external splints uh, make up the vast majority. Occasionally, I mold a plaster back slab to hold a much more unstable knee that I'm going to operate very soon. And then the external fixator for those unbraceable knees, the open dislocations, the vascular injuries needing repair, and the grossly unstable ones that you just can't keep stable with an external brace. The next step, get the diagnosis right. In the acute injury, the history is clear. The clinical examination tends to be not quite so formal, but much more obvious. It's often done as part of an examination under anesthetic, and the imaging is obvious. If there's a dislocation, you're going to see it on an x-ray, same for a fracture. And the MRI, the workhorse, is going to show you all your disruptions. In the delay presentation, it can be a lot more subtle. You've got to spend a lot more time getting a formal history on exactly what instability they're feeling. There are a lot of formal tests to do for each ligament complex. And the imaging can be surprisingly normal. X-rays can be normal. Even MRI scan can be normal following a chronic high-grade post lateral corner type injury. So stress x-rays and gait analysis come to the fore in the chronic setting. The PCL is the, the center of the knee. You need to reduce the PCL because you can feel it with an external measure. That's the medial tibiofemoral step off in neutral rotation. Everything gets assessed from there. Otherwise, you'll get false positives and false negatives. The ACL is a simple Lockman, the MCL and post remedial corner, stress it zero, 30 degrees. And for the post lateral corner, there's a host of tests. External rotation recovatum, various stress at zero and 30, posterior draw sign, posterior lateral draw sign, the dial test, the reverse pivot and the gate. The first four you can use in acute and chronic settings. The last two are really only applicable in the chronic setting. I rarely do a gait analysis on an acute multi-ligament knee injury. X-rays will show you the initial injury. It will confirm your reduction. It will identify fractures. And I always repeat it 24 hours after, especially those with a fracture of the tibial plateau, the medial plateau have a tendency to resublux and um, that is not something you want sitting for three weeks before you operate on it. Gives you the clues to the injury pattern. CT has a fairly limited role. It delineates specific fractures and CT angiogram. MRI is the workhorse here. Shows you the pattern of disruption, the site of disruption, the associated injuries, guides your surgery. Stress x-rays are used mostly in the chronic setting. I don't use them a lot acutely. Um, these three papers are dissection studies that showed exactly what it indicates when you've got increased opening. And the consensus is around two millimeters of opening side to side, you suspect a lateral collateral isolated injury. More than four, it's a higher grade injury. These are hard to do. You need to do them yourself. Getting your tech to do it is really useful because it, it's very hard to standardize actually. The next step is to get the overall treatment right. There's no good randomized control trial and there probably never will be. Evidence tends to support early repair and reconstruction combined with functional rehab. Operative treatment tends to do better than non-operative. Reconstructions tend to do better than isolated repairs and early surgery does better than late. What is the best timing? This meta-analysis by Kevin Tetsworth confirms that early surgery tend to do better in terms of clinical outcomes uh, in the majority of cases. This one by Bruce Levy and his group show that early treatment resulted in higher Lysholm scores, higher percentage of good to excellent IKDC scores, higher return to activity scores, and overall, this is where the numbers of around three weeks is considered an early cutoff come from. The optimal time is week two. You need enough time for capsular healing to allow for arthroscopy without too much fluid extravasation, but not too late that you can't easily dissect out repairable structures and repair them. Day 10, it tends to be ideal. Go too early and fluid's pouring out everywhere. Go too late and you can't dissect out the fi finer anatomy. And that's Bruce's uh, data that supports that. So now that last bit's get your surgery right. Mostly we're reconstructing uh, the cruciates. The literal literature supports reconstruction of the post lateral corner. It comes from this meta-analysis from Rob Lepardini's group that showed with post lateral corner injuries, the success rate is high, about 81% get a good result. It was 91% in those that had a reconstruction and only 62% in those that had an isolated repair. Stenard and Mariani's papers support the idea of be very cautious if you're just going to do an isolated repair of a structure. There is a role for it, but I always consider reconstruction. This is the way we approach it ourselves. And you can see that cruciate ligaments and post lateral corners, reconstructions are much more than repairs. So you will note the post lateral corner direct repair rate was 22% in our series. They're all the ones with a big piece of fibula head that's come off where you can get a very solid repair. Anything else we're reconstructing. 
Recent uses of internal braces at augmentation really hasn't come out yet in our data, so I can't tell you how that's going to affect things. In the chronic case, don't forget alignment. Soft tissue reconstructions are prone to failure in varus malalignment, and osteotomy alone can show really good outcomes uh, if there is a chronic post corner injury. These papers show good clinical results. It improves stability in those without any ligament reconstruction. It improved the outcomes for those that had it combined with reconstruction. And if you've got varus malalignment and a thrust, you will not win with a soft tissue procedure alone. When I'm in the theatre, I want everything right. Uh, the way Al's handling that case in front of you all is uh, truly amazing. That's a difficult thing to do. You want enough surgical time. You want a team that knows exactly what they're doing. Nursing team, anaesthetic team, radio radiographer. You need a good recovery team. You need the right equipment, both mechanical equipment and graft tissue. What grafts? There isn't a one answer for that. There's multiple options. You've got all the usual autograft options. You've got allograft options. And what I consider is three things. What graft do I need? How many tendons? How long? How thick? What graft can I get? What's the other soft tissue injuries to that patient? How invasive do I want to be? What access to allograft do I have? And then what's the cost of getting it? Whether that's a financial cost, a time cost, a skill cost, or an increased cost of trauma to that patient. What evidence exists? Not much in multi-ligament needs, mostly extrapolated from single ligament reconstruction. All the autograft options work really well. Autograft tends to be better than allograft. If you're going to use allograft, make sure it's non-irradiated. Uh, and there's little long-term data on synthetics at this point. In the acute case, with normal alignment, it's soft tissue surgery. In the delayed case, with any varus malalignment or thrust, consider combination with an osteotomy. In the ACL, I reconstruct it. I tend to use ipsilateral hamstrings in the majority of cases here. This is where I do think a patella tendon harvest is a little bit much for a traumatized knee. I add an internal brace uh, because I think the weight of evidence, it's not strong, but it trends towards benefit. I like a bigger graft. Again, I think the evidence definitely trends towards benefit. I put it in the ideal tunnel position. I bone graft that tunnel, as I mentioned during my case today. PCLs, I do a mixture of reconstruction and repair. You've got these full transections that need a full reconstruction, but there's this big pattern of highly stretched out damaged PCLs with a grade two, almost grade three that I used to manage non-operatively. Now I pass an internal brace and internally splint it um, so I can do better rehab, uh, and that tends to co uh, work quite well. The graft needs to be bigger and longer than in ACL. You've got multiple options, but I tend to use either an allograft or a tripled semi-T. You need it long. I uh, can't get that with a quadruple one, can't get the diameter with a doubled one, so you triple it. Uh, and I add the internal brace. This is Bruce Levy's work looking at the biomechanics of an internal brace in PCLs. It showed that adding the internal brace reduced the elongation. PCLs stretch out. You know, when I was first started my training, a grade two final outcome was considered good. Now we get them grade zero, grade one. They don't stretch much because of this kind of work. You get smaller elongation. Um, with the addition of the internal brace and you get stiffness closer to that of the PCL. Um, I won't run through this. I think Al's covered it nicely. Use post-remedial portals. Um, don't go too low. You need to get an anatomical footprint. It's a long way down there. Take your time. Dissect it carefully. Use your post-remedial portal and put it in the center of the uh, footprint. Um, I drill the femur inside out or outside in. I usually use a flip cutter to do that. Uh, passing the graft, I pass them through the medial portal because one of the issues here is passing the graft. You run it down into the tibial tunnel and then bring it back up into the femur. If I do pass it up the killer curve through the tunnel, I pass a probe through the back so I can lever it around the corner and dock it in the socket. You restore your step off, you confirm it with the other side. I always have the other limb undra uh, draped so that I can examine it during the case. Fix it on the tibial side, cycle and retention. And these braces make a big difference. These PCL jack braces where you can give a, uh, an anterior draw. I use them for PCLs and I use them for postlateral corners. Coming to the postural corner, it's mostly reconstruction, augmenting or repair of the three main structures on the side. I tend to use either contralateral semi-T or a fresh frozen allograft. There are multiple ways of doing this. Um, if it's grade two injury, I tend to do a fibula-based reconstruction, as described by Arciero, one tunnel on the fibula and two on the femur. Though I add fiber tags so that I can adjust the tension. I like to be able to adjust the tension. I, I struggle with screws to do that. Uh, I, I, uh, unfairly to Al called this the Robinson variation of the Leprata, the uh, Robinson and Get Good <laughs> described one. A single soft tissue graft. Again, um, Al's talked about how he's going to run that through. It's kind of good timing. I add tight ropes and fiber tags at all fixation points and back them up with screws so that I can tension them. 
The approach changes depending upon the context. The classic approach is that large posterolateral flap is three windows. The first window is posterior to the biceps and gets you to the common perineal nerve, which needs to be dissected and protected and past your fibula tunnel. The second window between the IT band and the biceps gives access to the joint line. And then the third through the biceps, uh, through the IT band gives you access to the tunnels. You can make that smaller and smaller depending upon the context. In a chronic case where you're only going to do a reconstruction, you do, can do quite a limited approach. So acute reconstruction and repair with a big approach. Delayed, it's isolated reconstruction. You can do a smaller approach or even a percutaneous approach if you're familiar with it. I'm a minimal interventionist on the MCL side. I consider non-operative treatment or simple augmentation. I do that by recreating isometry, a wire in the tibia, a wire in the femur. And then I find the isometric point by piecing a loop around it. I cycle the knee and I adjust the femur. If I need it loose, tighter in flexion, I can move it anteriorly or vice versa, posteriorly. If I want to change the tension and extension, I move it that way. Once I've got balance in the flexion and extension gaps and the isometric points, I insert either an internal brace of fiber tape or a single graft. I'm not doing an anatomical reconstruction in most cases. Uh, I'm doing a, a kinematic reconstruction so I can do aggressive rehab and let biology do the work. In the severe grade threes, I will do a modified uh, Laprade two limb reconstruction. So in short, work fast, fluid extravasation is an issue. Preserve your tourniquet time by preparing your grass first. I do the tunnels hardest to easiest. I work from the back of the knee forward. PCL tibia, ACL femur, PCL femur, ACL tibia, just back to front. Pass and fix the PCL on the femur, same for the ACL, then reduce the, tibia, the step off and fix it, then it looks like a knee again. Cycle and refix as you need. Uh, we pass the grafts, it's a, a complex weave where I half dock them and then I can tension them with the tight ropes and then fix them with screws. In summary, in the acute case, you need to manage the patient, not just the knee. There's acute trauma with associated injuries. In the chronic case, you're just managing the knee. And the diagnosis is pretty easy in the acute setting when you're looking at a dislocated knee and you've got a red hot MRI scan showing you all the injury. In the chronic case, it can be harder. The imaging can be normal, need a detailed history, a detailed clinical examination and stress x-rays. The surgery in the acute setting is reconstruction plus repair. It's got a large dissection. You want to be able to access everything. In the chronic setting, consider osteotomy for any malalignment. Minimally invasive approach is more viable. And the outcomes are good of both if you manage to approach it in the right way. So the idea of Kaizen is getting every little piece right and very small differences over time can lead to a big cumulative outcomes. So if you get your priorities right, you get the diagnosis right, you get your timing right, and you get your surgery right, you're going to get the best possible outcome. Thank you.